All right, so we've seen how to create threads and how to get multiple threads running. And if these threads are each doing their own thing, this works great. For example, when they're each counting from 0 to 99 and printing out, we've seen that works perhaps too well because the printouts come out in a jumbled order. So the interesting question is what happens when we want to make multiple threads, but we want them to cooperate in some way. Um, and this is where um, things can get complex, and we need to be... Um, aware of some of the possible outcomes of this. So let's let's um, go back to our MyThread class. And in MyThread, you know, we had a local variable, um, i, and we just incremented it from 0 to 99. I want to do something a little different here. Um, instead of having a local variable here, I want to have a shared variable. So I want each... Um, each thread to be able to um, access a single integer that's shared among all the threads. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, I'm going to go into my main um, class and I'm going to create a new type of object. Um, I'll just call it count c equals new count and say this object has an int all threads can share and when I construct a thread I'm going to pass it a copy of this count object and each thread's going to use that count object so let me make this count.java And this is just a holder for an int. So C is going to be our count inside here. Um, well, let me let me call it something better, like value. All right. So when I construct my thread, I'm going to pass it not only an integer i, but a count object called C. And up here, I'll have count c and inside here I'll say this dot c equals c so each thread has access to that shared count object and then in my run method instead of incrementing i I'm going to um, do the following for um, c dot value equals let me do this. We'll go ahead and we'll iterate a hundred times. But what we're going to do in here is we're going to say increment c dot value. And then at the end we're going to print out um, final value of the shared counter. All right, so um, so what is our run method doing? It's simply looping a hundred times, but instead of using the value of that index i, what we're doing inside our loop is we're incrementing this shared value, c dot value, which is this object in this, this um, count class, right? So we're gonna bump up that value a um, hundred times and then we'll print out um, the final value after this um, run method finishes and then we'll exit and our main method is going to you know create our three threads in the usual way give them each access to this shared count object start each of the threads have them run asynchronously and let's see what happens so we'll compile count We'll compile my thread. We'll compile main. And then let's run main. And, you know, one of the threads, um, so, you know, thread one started 
um, thread two started, thread three started. Um, the thread that ran first actually finished second um, and said, hey, you know, the final value of count is 100. And then the second thread um, actually finished first with its output and said the final count is 200. And then the last thread um, finished the count of 300 and said, you know, yeah, the count is 300. Um, so let's, let's make this um, a little more interesting. Um, let's go into here. And in addition to um, bumping up the value of the variable, let's print it out. Now, we're not changing the value of the variable. We're just printing it out after we do this increment. This probably should not change anything, right? When we run main, um, final value of shared counter is 300. But look at this. One of the other threads finished, and it said the final value was 289. One of the other threads finished and said the final value was 232. So we're getting some different behavior here. All right, so let's make this a little more interesting. Let's take a look at my thread. And um, in here, instead of saying plus plus C dot value, let's do the following. Um, let's do um, integer J equals c dot value. Let's print out the value of c dot value. Let's plus plus j and then let's c dot value equals j. All right, this should be doing exactly the same thing as before. The only difference is um, we're reading the current value from our shared object. We're incrementing it and writing it back. Um, and in between, we're printing out that value. But when we run this, we see something very different. We see the final value of the shared counter is 100. And in fact, the second thread also printed out that the final value is 100. And the first thread also printed out the final value is 100. So what's going on here? Um, Let's print out the ID in here. And let's print out the ID in front of this final message. And so let's look at the beginning of this. Our threads start thread three, thread two, um, thread one. Um, and as, as these threads are running, the value goes from zero, one, two, three, four, five. It goes back to zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Gets up to 20, up to 30, up to 39. And then it suddenly jumps back to six. And why is it jumping back to six? Well, it's thread two that's reporting that the value is six. And we notice thread two, the last value it reported was five. And even though thread one had incremented the value all the way up to 39, thread two suddenly chimed in and said, yeah, the current value is six. And we lost all of this count between here and here. And then thread two got up to 43. And at that point, thread three came in and said, oh yeah, the value is one. Well, thread three had started and said the value was zero, but then it got interrupted, right? It got pushed aside for threads two and one, and then thread two. And then when thread three came back into the game, it said, oh yeah, where was I? I was at zero. Okay, now the current value is one. And then when thread one um, came back, it was at a value of 40. But we've got something very different going on here, right? And in the end, 
we find out that you know all three of these think their shared counter value is a hundred. Now if I come in here and I just remove this print statement, the system behaves the way we would expect, right? One thread counted up to 100, the second thread counted to 200, the third thread counted to 300. So what's going on here? Well, the problem is that all three threads are sharing this one object, but it's possible that in between the time that the object's value is read, modified, and rewritten, another thread has taken over. So imagine that I'm beginning my thread and I read the current value, and the current value is zero. So I say j is equal to zero, and now I increment j, so j is equal to one, and at that point, another thread comes in and takes over, and it reads the shared value, and it increments it 100 times. So now c dot value is 100, because that other thread has finished all 100 increments. Now the system comes back to me and says, continue what you were doing, and I say, okay, yeah, my variable j was equal to 1. Let's set our shared value variable to 1. And I've just erased the result of that other thread that had counted all the way up to 100. So this is a very common problem when you have multiple threads sharing objects in memory. And I exacerbated the problem by putting in a print statement. And this print statement, the effect is it takes longer to get from here to here. And it's if this thread gets interrupted in between reading that shared value and writing the shared value, if it gets interrupted in between, that's when we can have this kind of data corruption. And so I put in a print statement, which takes you know a really long time compared to um, how long it takes to execute a few of these statements like this. Um, I increase the chance that this thread's gonna get interrupted in between this read and this modify and this write. And so with that print statement in there, we get this behavior where, um, you know, the last counter finishes and it only has counted up to 100. All right, so um, this is the notion of um, memory synchronization. And memory synchronization basically comes down to this thing we call RMW. This is read, modify, and write. And a lot of operations inside a CPU are versions of a read, modify, write. So it's very explicit over here, right? I read the value of a variable, I modify it, I write it. But even if I just say something like plus plus i, which is you know one of the shortest instructions we can write in C or in Java, um, this is still a read, modify, write. This is being coded in assembly language um, or in you know the microcode below the assembly language as find the current value of this variable i. Perhaps go out to memory or go to a register and read that contents, and then send it through an add circuit to add one to it, and then take that new incremented result and write it back into wherever this variable i is being stored, a memory location, a register, etc. cetera. Um, the difference is when we do plus plus i, that's a few lines of assembly language. That's going to happen very quickly there's not a great chance that those instructions will get interrupted. Whereas over here, um, the read, modify, write involves all of this stuff, including a print statement. So there's a better chance that this is going to get interrupted um, because we're going to um, you know, have a lot of assembly language instructions being executed or bytecode instructions in Java. Um, and so something like plus plus i, we can say this is non-atomic. It's divisible, right? So an atomic entity is an entity that cannot be divided, right? The Greeks thought everything was made of atoms, and atoms were the smallest 
building blocks and you couldn't break them into smaller pieces. So an atomic operation would be an operation that itself cannot be broken into smaller pieces. Um, and something like this, an increment instruction in Java, can be broken into smaller pieces. Um, it's possible that while this is executing, something can happen and another thread can come in, the current thread can be paused, and that's the source of these problems. Um, so we're going to want to be able to, um, to deal with that. Um, and in general, this is a hard thing to do. So one thing we could try to do is use a flag, or sometimes called a semaphore, and the idea would be, hey, how about when this thing is about to monkey with this shared value, it raises a flag and says, hey, I'm using the shared variable. Nobody else use it. All right. And then each process, each thread, before it starts to monkey with this, checks that flag and says, hey, is anybody waving the flag in the air yet? And if nobody is claiming that they're using this variable, then the current thread can raise a flag and say, I've got access to the variable. And if during this process, this read, modify, write, another process wants to start doing this, it will look and say, oh, that other process has the flag. I'm going to wait. And that works great as long as this flag is shared among all of the processes. But what would this look like? Um, we could have, you know, an integer flag equals zero, and maybe a one means it's in use. So what would we have to do before we start this read, modify, write? Um, if flag um, equals one, and we'll just sit there and we'll wait and we'll wait and we'll wait. And then we'll say flag equals one, do our read, modify, write, and then set flag equal to zero. So we can take this highlighted section of code, put it in here, and what's the logic? Um, there's this shared flag, just like we're sharing a count object, and this thread, each thread will see if the flag is set, and if it is, it will just sit there and wait. So it keeps checking, is it one, is it one, is it one? As soon as that flag is zero, it says, ah, nobody's using the flag. I'm going to go ahead and mark the flag as in use. I'll do my thing, and then I'll clear the flag. That works great in theory, but there's one practical problem, which is if you have two threads doing this exact same thing, and let's say the flag is originally zero, they both check to see if the flag is set. Each thread says, no, it's not set, and so each thread sets the flag to one, and now it thinks it has exclusive access to the shared variable, and both threads do the read, modify, write simultaneously. In other words, this process of reading the current flag value, modifying it, and writing it back, this is non-atomic. And because of that, because we're sharing this, this common variable that we're calling flag, we can have the same kind of behavior where two threads conflict with one another. So to get around this, we really need an atomic operation. So we need an atomic uh, flag management. And it's very hard to do by writing code. Um, generally, you need some kind of support from the hardware of the underlying CPU, or in this case, the simulated hardware of the Java virtual machine. And there is support for that, um, and that has to do with synchronization. All right, so we can use a keyword in Java. So let's take a look at the MyThread class. And the issue is that between here and here, we don't want this thread to get interrupted. As soon as this thread reads the current value of c.value, we want to make sure it's the only thing that's monkeying with c.value, which means we don't want any other thread to begin executing this chunk of code. In other words, we want this block of code between here and here to become atomic, uninterruptible. And we can do that with the keyword synchronized. 
and we can put code inside this synchronized block and everything in there will run exclusively. Now we might have multiple blocks of code we want to do this to, so we need to have something like a flag, something that's going to be used among all the threads that are dealing with the synchronized block to know is somebody else accessing this. This flag goes after the keyword in parentheses, and it can be any object that we want as long as it's a shared object. So since we already have this common shared object C, we can go ahead and use that. But we could, you know, create a common object and use that as long as each thread had access to the same object and so on. It doesn't have to be C just because we're doing C dot value. But any anything that's shared in common, and so let me put a, a comment here, only one thread can run the following block at a time. So if I compile my thread and I run main, now we've got nice well-defined behavior where the last thread finishes and reports that the value of the counter is 300. And that's going to work rock solid every single time. Now the, the previous threads are finishing and while they're finishing the count can be something other than, um, than 259. That's okay, right? Because we're expecting these, these threads to interleave with one another. Um, but at the end, um, the final count should be 300. Um, and if we, if we run this and we just look for the word final, we can get some rapid patterns of behavior. Um, and when the first two threads finish, the count could be pretty much anything, but when the third thread finishes, whether it's thread two here, or thread one here, or thread three up here, um, thread three somewhere, when that last thread finishes, um, the final count is guaranteed to be 300. So that's the easy way to synchronize, right? Um, by using the synchronized keyword. And we can, um, we can synchronize code like this, we can also synchronize methods, um, but we have to be careful with synchronization. Suppose I put my synchronized block like this. Suppose I take all of this and I put it inside my synchronized block. That's certainly going to avoid contention but when I run it, I'm going to see, and if I get rid of the grep, this will be even more clear. When I run it, I see what's happening is um, not really threading at all. Uh, thread two happens to begin first. It runs through its entire iteration of 100 um, times, reports its value, and then thread three begins, goes through 100 iterations, reports its value, and then thread one begins and finishes. And um, as we do this, right, the threads can begin and end in different orders, but, um, but we're not really threading anymore, right? Because we're basically saying that once this method begins, no other instance of this method in another thread can take place. So we don't want to do this. Um, so let me just throw a comment here. Don't more than you need. Right, so we've basically short-circuited the parallelism by, by putting all of this into a synchronized block. Um, so synchronize is a keyword. Um, and this, this comes up um, for example, when we look at um, some of the pre-existing classes, um, there's um, hash maps and there's hash tables, and they're very similar to each other, but one of the big differences is that hash maps, it says this implementation is not synchronized, which means if you have multiple threads sharing a single hash map, you can get into these kinds of problems. Um, and, and in that case, it's our responsibility to make sure that we manage 
the synchronization. So um, you're going to play around with that with the linked lists and the linked list um, class in the uh, in the problem set. So let me mention one other thing that um, that comes up when we talk about synchronization. This is sort of a classic problem. Um, it's called the dining philosopher's problem. And you can find lots of references to this online. You can find a good wiki page on it. Um, this is a problem actually poised by um, Dijkstra, as in Dijkstra's algorithm, to um, study concurrency and resource sharing in um, computers. And so it's, it's a thought experiment. And it's basically set up with, imagine, five people sitting around a table. And there's a bowl of food in the middle with something like spaghetti. And um, each person has an implement that they can use to eat. And the rule is that in order to take food from here and eat, you have to pick up the implement, the fork, for example, on both your left and your right. And these philosophers have two states. They have a talking state and an eating state. They can't talk when they're eating. They can't eat when they're talking. So a philosopher can sit here and talk. And while they're talking, they're not holding either implement. And then when they decide they want to eat, they have to pick up the implements on the left and right. And they can take food from the middle and eat as much of it as they want. It's an infinite bowl. And then when they're done, they can put their implements down. And then they can go back to talking. And the challenge is, can you find an algorithm for each of these philosophers to follow that allows them to all get a share of food, but also have time to, um, to talk? And it seems like a straightforward problem, but when you start trying to uh, spec out you know, pseudocode for an actual algorithm that they're each going to follow, it's a little harder than it seems at first. For example, you know, the most direct approach would be, hey, look on your left. If there's an implement there, pick it up. Then look on your right. If there's an implement there, pick it up. Well, if they all start to do this at the same time, each philosopher is going to look to the left, see an implement, and pick it up. And I'll draw an arrow showing to whom that particular fork belongs. And then they're all going to look to their right, and there's no fork there. And they're going to go into a wait loop, which says, OK, wait until that fork appears. Well, nobody's ever going to eat, right? No philosopher can get the fork on their right until another philosopher puts down the fork on their left. So we can say, you know, if you fail to get the fork on your right, put down the one on your left, wait a few seconds, and then try again. Well, if they all happen to wait exactly the same amount of time, this is going to be the same situation coming up again, um, and, and nobody's going to be able to eat, right? Um, so there's, there's different ways to try to deal with this. Um, but this is a theoretical model that lets us understand some of the issues that can come up when we have resource sharing. Um, and so, you know, one approach to this is to have an arbitrator, something like a weight person, who um, assigns forks to different people on some schedule. So maybe the weight person would say, okay, you and you take your forks and eat for two minutes. And then they'll blow a whistle and say, put your forks down. And then they'll say, okay, um, you and you pick up your um, forks and eat. And then they'll go on to these two and so on. And you can get out of it like that. If you allow um, forks to be marked as clean and dirty and you put in some weight algorithms, you can come up with a way to um, to allow um, everybody to eat and also everybody to have time to talk. Um, so this was, this was, you know, a thought experiment developed by Dijkstra as kind of a fun way to think about these issues. And Dijkstra was thinking about questions like, you know, if you have a single CPU and you've got maybe a printer and a card reader and maybe an arithmetic unit and um, maybe a single display, right, a printer of some kind um, and so on, how do you share these limited resources among multiple processes, right? If your computer is only doing one thing, it's not an issue. But if you've got five processes and some of them want to use the printer at the same time, how do we manage that? And so some of the, the issues that you can run into 
when you do this kind of, of um, multi-processing, um, include probably the most common issue is called deadlock. And deadlock, basically, um, one or more processes just freeze and they never get unfrozen. And an example of deadlock would be, um, you know, each philosopher picks up the fork on their left and then waits forever until the fork on their right is available. Well, since nobody's going to put down their fork, um, every process is stuck forever. Um, we might encounter this walking down the hallway. If I'm walking on this side of the hallway and somebody else is walking towards me on that side, and our algorithm is if somebody is in front of you, stop and wait for them to move. Well, if both people have that algorithm, they will get to where they're standing in front of each other. They will stop and they'll wait for the other person to move. And neither of them ever takes another step. So that's a deadlock situation. There's also live lock. And live lock is more like the situation where if you can't get the fork on your right, put down both forks, wait, and then try again. And that can happen if our algorithm walking down the hall is, hey, if you're about to bump into somebody, go to the other side of the hall. So we're two people walking, we get to where we're right in front of each other, and now we both come over to this side, and we try to walk, but we can't because there's somebody in front of us, and so we both move over to this side, and we try to walk, and we can't because there's somebody in front of us. So we're not just standing there staring, waiting, right? We're doing something, our algorithm is moving forward, but we're never advancing on the larger goal of trying to move further down the hall. So that's a live lock situation. And as you can see from some of the um, code examples that we just ran, um, when you have multiple threads in play, it's very hard to reproduce results. And so I might write a piece of code and it works great 15 times, and the 16th time I run it, something freezes. And maybe there's a deadlock, maybe there's a live lock. But chances are, if I just interrupt that process and run it again, it may work great. And so it's very hard to debug a process when you can't reproduce the failure. And so you end up having to do things like, you know, introduce um, monitor code into your code to look for the situation where you're locked up and then be able to report on you know the values of flags or where things are and so on and so forth but with with situations like this sometimes adding debugging code will actually change the bug sometimes it'll actually make the bug go away there might be something where two processes are working in just the wrong way that causes some kind of deadlock and if we add some extra conditional statements or some print outputs or we run it in the debugger that deadlock situation is avoided so this this is a challenging thing and when we have multiple threads we always have to think about things like synchronization um, shared memory um, read modify writes and so on and so forth um, so those can be um, challenges down the road all right, so these are all things to keep in mind. These are things that we're going to have to keep in mind when we move on to talking about networks and networked operations. And a lot of the potential issues there are actually handled for us. Um, if two things try to make a connection to a server at once, um, there's mechanisms in place that will make sure only one um, connection attempt succeeds at a time and, um, and handles this kind of synchronization for us. So um, you're going to have some uh, practice problems related to shared memory where you're going to um, play around with a linked list um, class um, that's provided for us under Java Util. And linked list is not thread safe. It'll, it'll tell you in the documentation it's not synchronized. So we're going to break that, right? We're going to break it by um, playing around with a linked list in, um, in multiple threads. And then we'll go ahead and we'll do some synchronization to fix it. Um, so that's, that's the first of two videos for today's class. The second video, which will um, be in a separate file, is um, just going to talk about Java documentation. Um, it's a small topic, but I wanted to put it in somewhere. So that's going to be the second video for today's class. All right, thanks.